babysitters that we take out to schools and you know teach kids and adults about the importance of wildlife in our environment and Humboldt disbanded their program and so they needed placement for Alice and we were fortunate enough at Pacific Wildlife Care to be in need of another educational animal and so we were able to obtain her for this purpose so she's Alice is 20 years old she's a female great horned owl and she weighs about three and a half pounds um, females are always about 30 percent larger than males of all raptors um, and reason could be for incubating eggs or who knows they you know they have more body mass so she um, is 20 that sounds pretty old it is um, in the wild she would probably be at the end of her life a, a average age for great horned owls in the wild might be 12 to 18 years um, depending on you know circumstances because she's in captivity her odds of living a longer life are, are pretty big so she I, I recently learned of a great horned owl at the San Francisco Zoo who is 50 so um, <laughs> so Alice may have some good years ahead of her still we hope and she is a, it's funny she's been in the educational program for her whole life um, and, and I'll explain how that comes about. Um, our mission, as with other wildlife care organizations, is to release back into the wild sick, injured, or orphaned um, animals. And usually native species, they come to us for a variety of reasons. Um, you know, usually man-made issues, trees being cut down with a nest in them or um, being shot, being hurt by a domestic animal, um, and as we're going to discuss today, rodenticide. So um, these, these animals, um, you know, I'll get into that in a moment, but basically we get them for a variety of reasons. Our goal is to release them back to the wild. In certain situations, they cannot be released back to the wild. So Alice was found as a baby on the ground with a broken um, wing in two places. You can see it droops a little bit, maybe right here. Yeah. And so what happened, you know, they tried to um, repair it, which we do often times successfully. It didn't work in her case. And she was a non-releasable um, bird as a result. So they were able to obtain the proper permits and keep her as an educational ambassador. And it is quite the process to get the permits, but um, I'll save that for another day. She's very vocal right now. Um, one of the reasons these both uh, mammals and birds end up in our care is through rodenticide um, poisoning. So what happens is um, people, you know, unknowingly or just, you know, just don't think about it, put out poisons for rodents and these birds, beautiful birds of prey, um, see what looks like a easy catch, like a, a poisoned mouse that kind of staggers around and they grab them, they eat them, and they get secondary poisoning. It oftentimes kills them. And a matter of fact, with great horned owls, they are pretty abundant and they've not been a threatened species, but in 2015, the, they started dwindling the population and they, um, attributed rodenticides to a big reason for that happening. So it's, it's a horrible thing. I do a lot of talks at wineries where people are so excited because they put up owl boxes to attract owls, which is a great thing. But then at the same time, they're using poisoning, rodenticides in the fields. So here are these owls, you know, and they're great new homes in these boxes. And they see one of these rodents that have been poisoned that's moving around still and they, they will grab them, sorry. Uh, <laughs> and uh, they will grab them, eat them, and then, you know, oftentimes die. So it's a really sad thing. It's, it's, it's really about education because a lot of people do not know, you know, that they're doing the wrong thing. But it's best it, just to let nature do its thing. You know, these animals eat an abundance of rodents, um, ground squirrels, other animals that without their help could cause, you know, create a problem in our environment. So it's nature at its best. It's, you know, 
they, they're doing what they're supposed to do and, and man interferes and we're the ones causing the problems. So if at all possible, please don't use poison, don't use rodenticides, um, especially for young you know, birds learning to hunt. It takes them a while to, to really get it down. And so easy prey, when they see a mouse down there that's you know, staggering around, they're gonna grab it and, um, and that could be the death of them. Um, so Alice, what she just did a moment ago was what we call baiting, and that, that's when they jump, you know, from your glove. And um, she's just a little nervous. We're outside right now at, on our property, and there's a lot of noises behind us, so she gets a little nervous sometimes, and then settles in. <laughs> and she's settled in now. <laughs> um, is it a good time for questions? Is her okay? I don't want to um, get into Judy's time too much, but. Um, you know, if anybody has any questions about, so I am with Pacific Wildlife Care. Um, our, our number is 543-WILD, and we um, take care of anywhere from 2,000 to 3,000 animals a year. Um, so that's, and, and our website is pacificwildlifecare.org. But um, please feel free to ask me any questions about Alice, about our group, um, or about rodenticides um, that you might have. So, um... Kelly, we have a question here. Uh, one of our um, attendees wants to know, how is an owl's age determined? Um, that's a good question. I mean, in captivity, we know, obviously, when they were born. Um, with birds in general, you can tell oftentimes by their feet, you know, when they're, when they're aging, um, they start, their feet start cracking out. Great horned owls have, you can see her talons here in her feet have feathers on their feet. Um, so it's not as visible as a lot of birds when they start cracking and looking older. I think if, you know, I'm not a biologist, but I think there's ways of determining like with any animal, um, you know, getting a really good guesstimate as to what age they are in the wild. Thank you. Does anyone else have a question they wanna ask and type it in the chat bar and then I can pass that on to uh, Kelly. And I will mention too, it's kind of obvious, but you can tell by her coloring um, with all great horned owls that they camouflage so well. So during the day, we rarely see them. They're, they're nocturnal, of course, so they're roosting during the day and they blend in with their environment very, very well. So um, it's rare that you'll just spot an owl, you know, unless it's dusk or at night, you might hear them first and look up and see them flying. Cool. All right. Any other questions for me? I can just close by saying that, um, you know, in the future under normal circumstances, we love to bring the animals out for educational purposes. We've done quite a few at the botanical gardens and um, we really just do our best to educate the public, kids especially, just they're like sponges and they take it in. And if we can convince our, our youth the importance of these this wildlife in our environment, we're, we're doing something right. That's our hope. Kelly, I've got one more question for you. Okay. Uh, someone says that she heard the owl barking. What was that about? Yeah. Alice or an owl? Uh, oh. Uh, yeah, I think I know what she's referring to. Okay. So, so screech owls, um, which is a tiny little owl that looks very similar to a great horned owl, but sits maybe six, seven inches tall. They will make kind of what sounds like a barking sound. They also have a really, they don't screech like the name implies, but they have a very soft kind of call that they make, but they'll also sound, I've heard them making, which is like probably part of their breeding process, like a barking sound. So um, owls in general, this is the time of year they're finding their mate. They're one of the earliest breeders we have um, of all the birds of prey. They usually start building their nest by January. Terrific. And then someone else says she's beautiful. Thank you for sharing, Alice. Aww, thank you so much for having us. We really appreciate it. Have a great meeting. Bye. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you, Kelly. So uh, next, Judy Newhauser will present more about uh, rodenticides. And Judy, you're going to share your screen, right? I'm going to share my screen in a moment, yes. Okay. 
So when that will pop up, Get that. I have host disabled screen sharing. All right, let me enable it. <laughs> you fix it. Okay, we're good. There we go. So can you see it? Um, click on your desktop one, and then okay. oh boy, and then make it big. Uh, desktop one. I'm not sure what you're wanting me to do. Let me escape. That's me. OK. I am screen sharing. <laughs> OK. I am going to mute. OK, hang on. Share screen. OK, here we go. I think I got it this time. All right. So you should all be seeing a picture of celebration doll chicks. Is that true? Um, Kelly, do you have me? Or um, Annika, do you have me muted? Uh, no, I can hear you just fine. Could you hear me before when I showed the picture of the owl? Yep. Uh, so I just started and I'm not going to hear you, but you will hear me. I, okay. I was probably muted. <laughs> so. And you, you see the owl now, right? Mm -hmm. Two little owls in yep. a nest? Good. OK. So I'm going to start with a story that uh, Morcos Audubon Society has about our great horned owls. We have had a great horned owl couple that have been mating and nesting at Sweet Springs for at least the last 10 years and probably longer. Um, this last year, they were su again successfully nested. They had two little chicks. They usually nest close to the trail and close to the ground. So it's been a great place for bird photographers to be able to come and photograph our owls. Um, and if Los Osos has anything even close to a mascot, I've got to say it's the Sweet Springs Owl at Moore Coast Audubon Society's uh, Sweet Springs Nature Preserve here in Los Osos. But this year, once the owls were about this old, a couple of days later, this is what we found at the bottom of the tree. This owl had been seen the day before. You can see that the feathers uh, in this area seemed to be matted and dark, and that's blood. And we noticed that it was bleeding and were concerned, and the next day, indeed, it was found at the bottom of the tree dead. We took that owl and sent it up to the Department of Fish and Wildlife. California Department of Fish and Wildlife has a uh, testing lab, wildlife testing lab in Sacramento, and the test came back positive for death by rodenticides, especially the second generation anticoagulants that I'll talk about a little bit later. The sad part also was that both chicks disappeared a day later. One chick we found two weeks later, nothing but skin, nothing but bones and feathers, but the other one was picked up at the bottom of the tree, very emaciated, very sick, and was taken to Pacific Wildlife Care, where it was kept in a little little uh, cage here. You'll see it spent a month in this cage with a mirror for company. Um, and it was treated for a month with what's called vitamin K. And vitamin K will reestablish the coagulation of the blood. It took a month of treatment for this little owl to be out of the woods. He's now down at the Ojai Raptor Center being rehabilitated. He's being taught how to fly. He's being taught how to hunt and then will be released. He will not be released at Sweet Springs because we are deemed an unsafe location because of the number of great horned owls that have been brought in from the general area with rodenticide poisoning. This breaks my heart. This is our wildlife preserve and our owls are not safe. So let's go through what's happening here. Um, this is the proximate cause, it's a rat. And most people do not like rats. 
Um, and we have this, this, um, this mentality that the way to deal with rats is eradication. And we've had that with a number of other species. Think of DDT and mosquitoes, eradication. And think of what the consequences of that were. The way I think we need to talk about this is not eradication, but is in management. So it does not become a problem. Rats are part, these are the, the black rats. They're a native rat. They're part of the ecosystem of this area. But there are places we don't want those rats. And I understand that. Um, same with ground squirrels, a native part of the of our ecology in this area. But again, we don't necessarily want them tunneling underneath our houses. I understand that. So one of the ways that we've decided to deal with it is poisons. Poisons seem to be very easy and as far as we know, very effective if we don't dig too deep. Um, I'm going to take you through a different, three different kinds of poisons. There are the acute poisons, and these are the ones that we used first. They're arsenic, strychnine, actually vitamin D3, uh, cholecalciferol uh, is actually a rodent poison, and it can be a human poison too. It will poison mammals. Zinc phosphate, bromothalin. These are all very acute, very dangerous, very lethal poisons. There's a couple of problems with them. Rats have learned very quickly to avoid them if they eat a sublethal dose. And so they don't usually come back for a second dose. The other problem is that children and other non-target animals are very easily poisoned by these. If they, a little kid gets into these and eats them, the problem is they're very lethal and there are no antidotes. So these kinds of poisons, especially the bromothalin and the vitamin D3 and zinc phosphate, you can buy on the shelf at, at the hardware stores these days but they come with cautions. So then there were developed the first generation anticoagulants, warfarin, uh, difasinone is one of the big ones. And these block the synthesis of vitamin K, which allows your blood to clot. They, again, are sublethal doses. The rodents need to eat several times and it decreases the primary poisoning risk of, of kids because there is an antidote. You can give, if caught in time, vitamin K, but remember the case of our little owlet. It took a month of vitamin K treatments to bring that little owl out of the woods. So it's not like you, oh, I just give them a, a dose of vitamin K and they're fine. You know, I can do that for my child. I can do that for my dog or my cat. That's not true. It's a very tricky, uh, antidote to use, it can be effective, but it is not always effective. The secondary wildlife poisonings tend to be longer. The, the persistence of strychnine and arsenic and bromothalin is very short in the order of hours. However, when you get to these first generation, we're talking about days, but they're not as much of a problem as the second generation anticoagulants which the two big ones are bromodialone and brodificom. These you can't even buy in hardware stores anymore. They were banned nationwide in 2014 by the EPA, but they were still allowed to be used by pest control companies. The EPA understood that these things were a problem for secondary poisonings and figured they could short circuit the problem if only pest control companies were allowed to use them. The problem with these is these rodenticides, these second generation anticoagulants, sometimes called eschars, they have a half-life of three to 12 months, which means that if there is some in the liver of an animal, it will still persist for that amount of time and still be lethal to any animal that would eat that. And that's the problem of the secondary wildlife poisonings. These are long-lived poisons and they move up the food chain very rapidly. How these anticoagulants work, as Kelly said, is the rat eats the bait. These are single feeding lethal doses. So a rat eats one dose, it will die. It won't die quickly, however, and it can go back and eat 
another dose and go back and eat a third dose and maybe even a fourth dose before it is so weak that it may not continue to feed. But at this point, it's not just toxic, it's highly toxic. The poison makes the rat thirsty because he's starting to bleed internally. And so that weakened rat actually comes out of the burrows looking for water. And at that point, as Kelly said, he's an easy target for a predator. Could be an owl, a hawk, an eagle, your dog, your cat. Um, and then that predator will die of internal bleeding or will drown trying to cure its thirst. This is a list of species. This list is actually three or four years old of species that have been documented to be harmed by these second generation anticoagulants, killed or being, uh, being given excessive mange. And the list is pretty long and it's actually, there are more than this. <laughs> And this is what people were finding on their front doorsteps, under their trees, on their sidewalks, were dead and dying raptors. And people became concerned. The, the weird part of this is that the, the second generation anticoagulants have a dye associated with them. It's blue. And this was a photograph taken by a wildlife photographer who documented an, a hawk eating a poisoned rodent. That blue color in the organ here, that is not a natural color in a rodent's organ. That is, that is uh, showing you that that particular rodent has been eating the second generation anticoagulants. And this hawk has a very good chance of ending up like this. The statistics we have in just California, and these are actually mirrored nationwide, show the presence of rodenticides in our wildlife. These are animals that have been brought into wildlife uh, care, like Pacific Wildlife Care, or have been found dead and then have been tested. And the numbers of these that are showing severe rodenticide exposure is overwhelming. I saw a, a data the other day that said a hundred percent of the great horned owls in San Diego County have tested positive for these rodenticides. So these hawks, these owls, these eagles are all nesting in our areas. They bring their rodents back and they're feeding their, their chicks and by feeding their chicks they are now poisoning their own children. Rodent eating ma mammals, such as little foxes, such as your cats, your dogs, um, skunks, possums. There was a possum brought in from French hospital a couple of months ago that was uh, tested positive for rodenticides. So it's getting, it's targeting a lot of different wildlife. These are scavengers. You might not think of them as predators, they're scavengers. And they will eat whatever they little animals they can find that are sick or recently dead. Mountain lions. Southern California has lost a number of mountain lions to these rodenticides and it's just tragic. The whole subspecies of mountain lion in Southern California seems to be at risk. It can even go along the food chain up into the vultures because, again, remember these rodenticides are persistent in the environment and persistent in those animals for up to a year. Even your little dog Bodhi is at risk. If you start talking to your friends and neighbors, you'll hear stories of them having their dogs poisoned by poisoned rats. Some of their dogs have survived, some have not. So in summary, what we know about rat poisons, um, there are huge costs in terms of human health, mortality of pets and wildlife, and then the whole degradation of the food chain and the environment. You lose your top predators, you have changed your environment significantly. Over the years, um, some of the rats have developed a resistance. They've developed a resistance to things like warfarin within 10 years of using the poisons. Will that same thing happen with the second generation rodenticides? And 
this is probably one of the biggest tragedies. You are destroying the very predators that are most useful for controlling your rodent populations. So the good news in all this, California AB 1788 was recently passed by both the California State Senate and Assembly, and it was signed by Governor Newsom a little less than two weeks ago. And it's a moratorium on the use of these second generation anticoagulant rodenticides starting January 1st. The Department of Regu Pesticide Regulation must address secondary wildlife poisoning in a meaningful way. And there's a lot of documentation in the literature, so the scientific literature, about the problems that these rodenticides are causing, the havoc, the carnage. Um, there is an exemption in this one, too. The pest control companies are no longer allowed to use them except in agriculture. And as Kelly mentioned, wineries are considered agriculture. So they are allowed to use them around the wineries. They're allowed to use them around the breweries. They're allowed to also use them around medical facilities. So this is something to watch for. And I'm really glad Kelly's doing the kind of, of education and outreach to the wineries that she's doing because by installing owl boxes and then poisoning your rodents, you are drawing predators in in order to kill them. And that is not, well, it's kind of productive. So I want to go back to Sunlit Spring again. We know what an eradication mentality does. It brings us to in the case of the 60s, it brought us to a silent spring where we started losing our songbirds because of DDT. So my question to you is, is rat poison our new DDT? Is this also leading to cascade effects in our ecosystems as we lose our predators? So let's take a look at what it is we can do. You know, why is it we have rats? That's the foundational question. Why are we having a rat problem. We're, we will always have rats. They're part of the ecosystem. But why are they becoming a problem? Well, I would contend that the first picture is a huge reason why. All animals need food, water, and shelter. And we humans have been very lax in keeping our food sources away from the animals that we do not want to promote. And you will see huge amounts of trash and garbage and food, people feeding animals. Um, it's drawing in the rats. So that is a huge issue. The second picture I have is a picture of an ivy vine. Now ivy you can call a rodent condo. It has everything those little rats need, food, water, and shelter. It's very dense. The predators have a hard time getting into it, therefore shelter. Oftentimes it's watered, a ah, water source for the rats. And the snails love it. <laughs> rats love to eat snails. So like I say, it's a condo. So look at the vegetation around your house and decide whether you, what you are doing is fostering rats coming to your area. And the last thing you need to look at is little holes. Rats can get through very small little holes and into your houses. I had rats in my ceiling. Twice I had them in my ceiling. I found the first hole, patched it up, the rats were gone. I found, had rats again, found the second hole. The rats have now been gone for several years and I haven't had any problem with them in my house since then. Marin County has what is called an integrated pest management program. And what that means is instead of going strictly for the poisons as the first line of defense, they take a look at the biology of the pest, the food, the water, and the shelter. They monitor to see are they having a problem with rats, not just presence, but a problem with the rats. And if they are, that's where you get to the threshold. You need to do something. So they're working with biological controls. They're working on encouraging raptors to come into the area. They work on physical and mechanical Ways of dealing with those pests, such as trapping, cultural methods might be getting rid of ivy close to the buildings, along with some of those horticultural methods. So what you can do if you have an issue with rodents, first of all, please do not use poison. Because by using poison, you are exacerbating the problem. Because you are probably ending up killing the predators who are your best friends in this case. 
There's an organization called Raptors Are the Solution, www.raptorsarethesolution.org. Um, and they have lots of information I'm going to talk about in just a moment. If you feed birds, clean up the dropped seeds. The rats come in for food and they come in for water. And so I actually have quail that are, do a very good job. They come in in the evening and they scratch around and pretty much all of the seed that's on the ground is gone by that point. Practice good housekeeping. Do not leave your cat and dog food out at night. That's an invitation to not only the rat but also rats and other animals that you may not want coming by your house. Make sure you've got your dumpsters, your trash cans, clothes, and are rodent proof. Um, make sure you keep tree branches away from your house so that rats that go up the trees and across the branches can't jump onto your roof and find all those little small holes that may be up there. Make sure all the tiny holes are sealed. There are companies in this area, there's one in Morro Bay uh, that I saw the other day that specializes in closing up any entryway that rodents may have into your house. Rip out ivy patches, those little rodent condos that are right near the house. Leave six feet of space between an ivy patch if you must keep it and your house. That six feet of space, rats don't like to, to cross open ground because that's where they're vulnerable to the predators. Use traps, carefully place traps. Make sure they're in areas where the rodents are actually feeding. And I have this in all capitals, never use glue traps. The problem with glue traps, especially when they're outside, is they attract insects. Insects get stuck in them and birds like to eat insects. There are multiple cases of people finding little warblers, um, hummingbirds that are trapped in the glue traps and you cannot get them out of those. They're dead. So please don't use glue traps. There are other traps I'll show you in just a minute. If you do hire a pest control company, demand that they actually practice, don't just say they practice, but actually practice integrated pest management, that they're making sure food, water, and shelter are gone from the area, and then ask them not to use poisons, please use traps. So lots of different kinds of traps on the market these days. There are electronic zap traps, such as this radicator, uses electricity, it, it electrocutes the rat, you dump the rat out, it's a perfectly uh, fine rat for a scavenger to pick up. So you will be encouraging the scavengers to make sure they're coming behind, cleaning up anything that's left. Um, snap traps. This is not the, your normal snap trap uh, that you can get your fingers caught in. Uh, lots of new different kinds of snap traps, this black one and very effective. And then there's the A24 CO2 trap. This is kind of an interesting one. There's a CO2 cartridge that powers a piston. There's a bait at the top of this little black tube. The rat comes up to get the bait. There's a sensor in there. Oops, sorry. There's a sensor in there that shoots a piston at the rat, hits the rat in the head, the rat falls down dead, the scavengers come along, pick up the body, and the trap is set for the next one. This cartridge can shoot 18 times before you need to replace it. So a very good little non-toxic trap, non-toxic self-cleaning trap. So the last part is to encourage the raptors in your area. And that's where Raptors Are the Solution comes in. This was started by a woman up in the Bay Area who noticed that the cooper spots were falling dead on her sidewalk. And this really distressed her. And so she started an organization called Raptors Are the Solution that has been extremely effective in what they do. They are the ones who are responsible for suing Department of Pesticide Regulation to make them reevaluate secondary wildlife poisoning. And for 10 years, it, the 10 years it took them to push AB 1788 through the California legislature and be signed by the governor, that was also Raptors at the Solution. That was the lead on that one. You know, we think of raptors as being in the wildlands, and that's not true. They are, but they are everywhere. Peregrine falcons are nesting in Los Angeles. They nest in New York City. Pale male in New York City was a red-tailed hawk that nested on an apartment building across from Central Park. There are raptors all over our urban and suburban areas. Um, this is a northern harrier hawk, and I usually think of them as grassland uh, predators, and this one's caught a rodent and it's obviously flying through a suburban area. We have red-tailed and red-shouldered hawks. 
that are in our neighborhoods. And not only are they living in their neighborhoods, they are nesting in our neighborhoods. And they're raising their children, raising their young in our neighborhoods. If you have a one of these large palm trees, it's very possible that you have a family of barn owls that is either roosting or nesting in your palm tree. So keep an eye out for them. These raptors are everywhere. And one family of barn owls can eat 1,300 mice. That's 1,300 mice in a year and 3,000 rodents in one breeding season alone. So these are incredibly effective predators. They're even found in what we would kind of call our urban wastelands um, because there's rodents down there too. There's food, there's shelter, there's water down there and the predators are on the job. You won't find pest control companies down, coming down here, but the predators are there. The raptors are there. In fact, the raptors are everywhere in our communities. One red-shouldered hawk can kill 30 rodents in a month. That's one a day. So you can either poison it, the rats, in which case you're poisoning the red-shouldered hawk, or you can allow that red-shouldered hawk to do its work and it will continue to eat 30 rodents in a month, month after month after month. And then it will raise its children. <laughs> we have uh, a red-shouldered hawk that nested in our property down on Vince Carth and Doris in Los Osos this year. We, that red-shouldered hawk managed to raise two fledglings. They're eating a lot of rodents in that particular neighborhood. So encourage these animals and don't poison them once you've encouraged them. Ventura County Watershed Protection District had an interesting study. They're responsible for the levees in their area and they had been using rat poison and they were convinced to run an experiment. So in one section of their levees, they used the traditional rat poison. And you'll notice if you look carefully, that says, you know, one feeding, you know, kills the rats. <laughs> and in the other section, all they did was put up raptor poles. Yes, there's trees, but these raptor poles are really effective at giving that owl a perch where they're in the open, they don't have to go in through the branches and looking for rodents on the levees. They found one third the number of new squirrel holes as they did in the area that used the poison. So although we think of poison as being the fast and dirty, really effective one, and the raptors yeah, kind of do an okay job, this study showed that in this case, they were actually extremely effective and far more effective than the poisons. Plus, they saved $7,500 per mile of levy by using, encouraging, and taking care of their raptors. So raptors are the solution not only dealt with lawsuits and legislation, but most of what they do is education. And they have a, a website that has lots of information about what is the problem with their identicides and what are the alternatives. They have posters about everything you can imagine. They put up billboards up and down the state. This is one that's in San Luis Obispo that was sponsored in part by the Moro Coast Audubon Society. They put up posters on bus stops and on the sides of buses. They have posters, they have probably 50 different posters, some in Spanish, some in English, with all sorts of different owls and hawks. So depending on what your favorite hawk or what your local neighborhood hawk is, you can find a poster that will match. They also deal with nesting birds. So if you have a bird, a predator, a raptor nesting in your area, find out what it is, download the particular animal that's nesting, print these signs out, put them on all the telephone poles in your neighborhood in order to alert people that if you poison your rats, you're poisoning these predators also. They've, rats has worked, raptors are the solution is what I refer to as rats. Raptors are the solution. <laughs> um, they've also worked with various uh, Audubon societies and other organizations doing community outreach. They've worked with 4-H clubs. 
They've worked with Eagle Scout projects. This is an Eagle Scout project where this young man built owl boxes and worked with the winery to make sure they were not using poisons and then built and installed owl boxes for them. So before you reach for that rodent poison, I'd like you to remember this cartoon and call for your new pest control company. So thank you. That's the end of my slide presentation. And I'm going to stop screen sharing.